Hello, friends. Hello, 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 friends. A tradition unlike any other. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. In your life have you seen anything like that? There it is! Adam Scott, a life changer. Mashed potato! Here it, here it, here it, here it comes. Our great friends at Puma Golf are proud to introduce the new Ignite Articulate Golf Shoe, taking cleated innovation to the next level thanks to an all-new articulating outsole, midsole, and upper that is designed to flex with your foot and deliver the highest level of support. Built to meet the rigorous quality, aesthetic, and performance demands of the world's best golfers, the Ignite Articulate combines Puma's tour validated technologies in a lightweight, extremely comfortable package with a modern athletic silhouette that can handle any swing from any lie in any season. Make your move now. The Ignite Articulate are available in store and online in Australia, starting from just $250. For more information, visit cobragolf.com.au. This is the 19th T podcast, Kieran Marsh. Nathan Drudy back with you after a week's hiatus. Uh, Dreadster, as with most workplaces around the country, uh, really struggled to get a third gear in January. So we didn't want to peak too early in the year. Uh, and in fact, there wasn't a real great reason to record anything last week, as it mm. turned out. So we decided to give ourselves an additional week off. Um, as you, you and I'm sure many of our listeners uh, and uh, viewers via the YouTube channel can tell by the different piece of artwork in the background, I am on location uh, yes. this week. Yes. Uh, so particularly for those audio only on the 19th, I do apologise if the quality of my voice uh, is a little different. Some might say an improvement um, without the microphone on location, but I am in, I was going to say your part of the world, but I'm actually distinctly two and a half hours south of you. Uh, mm. Beautiful southwest. I will be back here in uh, roughly a month's time for a uh, live from the wedding. Um, yes. <laughs> just a little, little little preview trip down south, the beautiful Margaret River region. So plenty to get through, my friend. Um, mm. Plenty to get through as per usual. want to start, though, um, Certainly, I think one of my favourite chats that we've had um, across the last, I reckon, 18 months, and we're very fortunate to have been joined by um, a variety of different people from all walks of life in the golfing space, but um, one that sticks out for me is certainly Cassie Porter. Uh, we had a chat to Cassie, I suppose, right on the eve of her decision to turn pro, and she's clearly a name that sticks out in that incredible crop of young female golfers coming through the Australian ranks at present uh, and she had a breakthrough so to speak uh, across the weekend her maiden win as a professional uh, the WPGA event in Melbourne she did it on the fourth playoff hole Drewster uh, mm. and in scenes reminiscent of the Queensland PGA championship for the men at the Nudgee golf course it was two best friends in the playoff mm. uh, she got the Got the chocolates over her good friend, Kelsey Bennett. So uh, an incredible result over the weekend for a good friend of this podcast and wonderful to see Cassie, I suppose, reach the the heights that she had kind of flagged as her aspirations moving forward in that chat not long ago. Well, yeah, and it shouldn't be shouldn't be understated uh, of what Kelsey Bennett achieved as well. That was her first uh, WAP, uh, WA, fuck me, WPGA Tour of Australasia event since turning pro. So she's... Um, started pretty well uh yeah and as you mentioned i mean we everyone i think kind of knows the talent that cassie porter has and she took the the outright lead um i think coming down the stretch and, and forced uh kelsey to make a, a birdie on the final hole to send it into extra holes and um yeah four holes is is what it took and a two-putt par which is always a nice comfortable way to secure a trophy um is how she did it so yeah, very good tournament um, by the looks of things that was uh, played um, <clears throat> that was out in Melbourne at uh, the Melbourne International, as you said, and a really good field. I mean, if you look at some of the the names on that list in, in Porter and Bennett, obviously two up the top and Karis Davidson there, Mamoka Karobi, another a name that we've known plenty about and Steph Nahr and, and Catherine Norris and Crystal Blum, like there's plenty of names that were there. So uh, really good to see Cassie get the, get the chocolates and, um, yeah, we, we know that she's going to be a fantastic talent and I echo your sentiments, mate, about uh, how good of a chat it was to have her on the show. Yeah, I think probably testament to her standing 
um, amongst that group was the reaction of her peers. Mm. Obviously, I think probably taking nothing away from Kelsey Bennett, I'm, I'm near certain it would have been exactly the same had she been the one to triumph. But, yeah, just the, the sheer number of players that ran on to the green to embrace Cassie. Um, you know, Karis Davidson is the, the third leg of that tripod, so to speak. The three of them incredibly close, and Karis herself played very well over the course of the tournament, kind of led that that charge of the celebration. But, yeah, Cassie's, a, I think, an incredibly talented player, but for, for that matter, incredibly grounded. Uh, I think that comes from being part of a, you know, really solid community out of the Pridgeen Springs Club on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And, you know, I, you know, I kind of read some quotes from her at the back of that win and how disappointed she was to miss out on Q School at LPGA. And, you know, the, the focus now turns to the Epson Tour and performing well there in the early parts of that season, trying to improve her status. So great to see you kind of get a win, I'm sure, that will build confidence and, and most importantly, the big mo through its momentum. Um, mm. is there is no substitute for it in sport. So, yeah, wonderful result for a, for a really talented young player and one that we certainly think has got a huge future. So uh, we were all set to have a conversation with her this evening. Um, however, she got a better offer. She's a tennis. Mm. So, uh, and our schedules didn't align. So she's mm. going to join us a little later in the week, uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, of course, that'll be ahead of the TPS tournament, uh, which both men's and women's are playing. Uh, it'll be the return of the men's competition, for that matter, the TPS Victoria, hosted by Jeff Ogilvy at the Rosebud Country Club, the composite course there. So Cassie will join us just ahead of that tournament on Wednesday evening, a chat that you'll hear on Thursday night. But a big congratulations to Cassie Porter with that maiden professional win. It was just worth noting as well on the uh, on that second playoff hole that she um, birdied from around 50 feet and then uh, Kelsey Bennett stepped up and did the exact same thing from around 40 feet and um, uh, Cassie got the ball out of the cup for, for Kelsey and they, they embraced and they were very happy for each other, which was very nice. But uh, good to see. Good sportsmanship. Um, I always, always like to see. You, that's the enemy. That's always the enemy. It's in their playoff. That's, as, as some people say, that's food off your table. Don't. Mm. Don't embrace the enemy, but no, nah, good to see. Good good sportsmanship. Yeah, I think there's probably a, a, a small few occasions where you can excuse it and there's two best <laughs> going heads ahead. That's certainly one of those yeah. occasions. Uh, Drew's not the only Australian to taste a bit of success over the weekend on the men's side. Uh, incredibly productive weekend for Jack Thompson mm. uh, in the Asian Tour Q School. Uh, yeah, remarkable. I mean, I think we always love this time of year because whether it's a story like Cassie's breaking through for a maiden professional victory, a story like Jack's who, you know, leads and ultimately wins that uh, Q school and sews up status for next year on the Asian Tour. Like, this is a transformative period of the year where people are really changing their uh, immediate future and potentially a long-term future, and that's certainly the case for Jack Thompson. As I said, ceiling status with a you know a very convincing performance in the Asian to uh, Q School final round. Ninety holes as well uh, is is how long the the uh, fair test. that is a fair test. Five days of golf uh, to to play. Um, I, I mean, look, Jack's going to be another one that will come back on the show. We've had him on for and for those who have listen to that episode if you haven't i'd certainly encourage you to go back and do that um but they he was uh so determined to get to where he wants to be and um it's certainly no surprise to see him uh aloft um of the asian tour final stage of uh of q school finishing out right first um a couple of shots ahead of Another Australian in John Lyris, who also locks up his card. But, uh, yeah, 64-66 in the final two rounds. I mean, it'll do it for most people. And, you know, he's done he's done some really nice things. I mean, he's won the Gippsland Super 6 uh, tournament at the back end of 2021. And um, he's played some nice golf since then. But, um, yeah, he uh, he got back to our message, I mean, probably about 15, 20 minutes ago uh, when we we asked him to come on tonight. And I mean, he just said, sorry, he's just been flat out trying to plan out a schedule. So 
Uh, we'll hopefully have him on later in the week, but just excited for for Tomo and and the other boys who have qualified um, qualified there as well. So yeah, massive shout out to to Tomo there. Absolutely, you mentioned Johnny Loris in a tie for second, two shots back. The other two Australians, uh, Doug Klein and Jack Murdoch, earning their cards. Uh, on the flip side of that coin, um, some really hard luck uh, for two very good friends. Of this podcast in Aaron Wilkin and the Greek freak Dimi Papadados, who both missed the playoffs for the final two cards by a single stroke. Uh, mm. So certainly disappointing for those two boys. A tie for forty third there for them. Uh, I'm sure they'll come home, reassess, and and you know have a crack at a number of Asian tour events across the season without full status. But uh, just fell short on this occasion in terms of some other results. Um, Aiden Hopewell, tie for 53rd. Louis Dobler, tie for 70th. Uh, Dane Lawson, tie for 88th. Uh, just want to make a special mention. I shouldn't laugh. Um, Pikey, Aaron Pike. Mm. Um, missed cut 72, 73, but that's not why I raise it. Uh, we don't have the requisite time to go into a chapter and a verse, but if you don't already, follow Pikey on Instagram and, and try and wrap your head around the absolute journey uh, well, both he and his clubs have been on through Asia, uh, seemingly in the past seven to ten days. Um, yes. So understandable probably for Pikey to miss that. There's been a few distractions going on with literally his tools of the trade. Uh, <laughs> no. So uh, take a look on Pikey's Instagram if you've got a spare five minutes and, and empathise with uh, a genuinely good good man. Um, Drewster, uh, mm. we should, before we turn our attention overseas. Uh, a quick look. I mentioned briefly the event coming up this weekend, the TPS Victoria, hosted by Jeff Ogilvy at the composite course at the Rosebud Country Club. Of course, uh, PGA and WPGA event. Return of the men's. They've had a substantial break um, since the last event before Christmas. Uh, wondering if you've turned your mind maybe to some tips or some thoughts on people who you think May factor in this return. Always hard coming off um, in racing parlance a spell, but mm. everyone's coming off it at the same time. So it's uh, obviously some people have been, whether it's at Q schools or other such events, they haven't been not hitting a ball for six weeks, but certainly as it relates to competition golf here in Australia, it is a return after a significant break. Yes. Uh, I've had a, I've had a brief look. I think um, it was interesting. The, uh, there was a blitz golf event uh, that happened earlier in January, which was a fantastic success. And, mm. and uh, I've seen the highlights package um, of that. And I like some of the form lines that might come out of there. There's a, a young player by the name of Max McArdle that I really like the look of at the moment, who's hitting the ball very, very well uh, played nicely at uh, the blitz golf uh, tournament. Didn't make it through to the final, but played well, nonetheless. Uh, Lincoln Ty, I think is, is a player that were, uh, was in decent form heading into the break and he'll look to continue uh, that. I mean, this is a really, really good field um, that is that has been um, assembled here. I mean, there's a lot of names uh, who are going to be missing the cut who aren't actually going to even get into the, into the field, which is quite phenomenal. Um, but I'd encourage everyone to go online and have a, have a quick look at that in terms of a winner. It's, as I said, very, very difficult to pick a name out, but I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll back to the very top of the uh, of the entry list, and I think the winner is going to come out of one of inside the top maybe fifteen or sixteen players. So I will give you, in terms of a winner outright, I think back in his home state will be mm-hmm. loving the opportunity to get in front of the home crowd. I'll give you Dave Michaluzzi. As there a, it is. There I'll it give you a guy who I think is also, uh, for lack of a term, a roughy because people, he's a very quiet achiever, uh, is Jay McKenzie. Uh, he won the uh, WAPGA last year out in Kalgoorlie, but he he loves it. He can genuinely play. So I'll give you him as a bit of a roughie, but I think the, the winner is going to come from sort of that top 15 or 16. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how Jeff Ogilvy goes as well. I think that'll be, um, be interesting, but there's plenty of really good names. Josh Armstrong won a, 
won a uh, a title in New South Wales over the break as well. So there's been plenty of plenty of form. I mean, a lot of these guys were on that list, that Asian Asian Tour uh, qualifying list. So be interesting to see how everyone comes back. Who are you going? Well, just preface it by saying not difficult to pick the bloke who's cumulatively the best score under par through all the events so far and in the summer, first half of the summer. So that's, that's well, a, that's, you know, you've really reached on that pick for Mika, haven't you? Back you uh, you asked me who I thought was going to win, and and look, you know, tipping winners is taking all the all the all the factors out of it, and I think he's it. Similar, similarly, to you, I'm going to run through a few names. Mm, please, first and foremost, right at the top of my list. Uh, and it's only because we haven't seen much of him, is Anthony Quayle. Mm-hmm. So obviously, he spent most of the first half of the uh, Australasian PGA season in Japan, where mm-hmm. he's obviously got full status on the Japanese tour, finishing off that season. So I haven't seen much of Quayle. And I'm not yeah. suggesting one way or the other on performance. I'm just curious to see how he comes off that break. Um, yeah. uh, and he's a great man, love Quayle, so interesting to see that. Um Similar but different reasons, Jared Felton, a guy that you tipped to win the order of merit, and I think by his own admission, pretty disappointing first half of the season, certainly below what we know he's capable of. So I wonder what the break has done to Feltz. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I get the sense that we will see a a vast improvement from him in the back half of the year. Mm. He's too good and I think mentally too strong not to perform when it matters. So... Interested to see felt um, standing interest in uh, our man, uh, the wizard Justin Warren. To see where he's at. <laughs> just, just, just love the whiz. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Similarly, Gailey. Like Gailey for me. Uh, we had that chat with Port, you and Porter, a week or two ago, and, and Maybe my favourite part of that outside of the Nathan Follower story was the two and a half minutes we spent talking about the golf horse. Mm. So the guy is just, he's come off some indifferent performances here at home, but that's because he's been all over the world seemingly in the back half of 2022. I think with a focus squarely on the second half of the Australasian season and, you know, outside of the two Blue Ribbon events in the PGA and the Australian Open, I think, cumulatively on volume the second half of the season is stronger. They are big events coming, particularly yep. that second end up. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Gailey go on a bit of a run here. Um, Matt Van Cliff is another guy I think ended the year really, really well. Uh, and I think is primed to, you know, start stringing together some more consistent top 10, top five finishes. So I'm interested to see where Matt finishes. Uh, all of that is to say, I don't think any of those are our winner. Um, in, in the Rosebud Country Club. So I'm looking at, to your point, I think it is that kind of top group of guys. Uh, and I'm going to say, sorry, one other one I'm keen to see, Hayden Barron. I just mm-hmm. want to see where, where Baz is at because, yeah, um, obviously sewed up that place at the Open Championship with a phenomenal finish at the Australian Open. Uh, but... His challenge now is to make that consistent across four days of the tournament and continue to, you know, start to pull those performances together week in, week out. So certainly capable of it. Uh, want to see him deliver on it. Uh, all of that is to say I think our winner, similarly, a, a local, a Victorian, uh, I'm going to say Dane Lawson, mm-hmm. wins for the second time this season at the Rosebud Country Club. That's my uh, That's my tip. For okay. CBS. And then on the WPGA side, very, very excited to see Steph Kuriaku playing in their back home mm. and keen to see Steph. So I'm, I'm going to not go chapter and verse on the women's side. I'm going to say Steph Kuriaku, one and done. Um, okay. Both excited to see her playing at home and expecting her to win. Okay. I no will. No, 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 not by the sounds of it at all. Uh, I didn't give a tip on, on the women's side. I'll give you uh, Crystal Blum. Though I think she will, uh, she's playing very well at the moment. Question for you, uh, without notice, which we like to do. So obviously, Cam Smith is leading the order of merit at the moment, but it's kind of irrelevant. So we're really looking at Dave Michaluzzi being the order of merit leader with 510 points. Mm. Minwoo Lee and Adam Scott are, are next. Andrew Martin, 411. Jason Scriven has only played a couple of events, and Tom Power Horan. Mika, 
has do we think that he's locked up one of the cards or is close to locking up and is he kind of the runaway winner here knowing that we now get some of the bigger tournaments on the uh, on the agenda I know we've had our two flagship ones but we get some more consistent bigger points coming up in this run of events yeah I would say locked up mm. I mean if you if you look at it so top three not otherwise exempt is my understanding so as, as you've just pointed out Smith Minry Lee Scott all G yeah going going back to DP World Tour, if they choose to. Obviously, Minwoo plays there quite a lot. Cam Smith can't currently play there. Um, and Adam Scott plays a handful of events that are co-sanctioned. So um, so if you take them out, Mick is obviously leading, you're saying 510, but Andrew Martin is the next on 411. So mm. Mick is less than 100 points ahead. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say locked up at all, mm. especially when you consider the points on offer uh, in those handful of events through the back end. Um, you know, and those flagship events in New Zealand as well. So yep. I think he's put himself in the box seat. There's no doubt about that. Um, there's not a lot of guys that are close to him that have played significantly less tournaments as well. So I think that that bodes well. Of the guys that are playing a lot, he is the best. That's clear. Mm. You know, Martin, same amount of tournaments. Tom Powell Horan, same amount. Digger Lawson, same amount. Hayden Barron, same amount. Wilco, same amount. You know, they're the ones that are in and around his score, and he's he's comfortably the best of the ones that have played the full summer. But, yeah, not locked up by any stretch of the imagination, and I, I would be surprised if he's in that way as well. Well, to give you the uh, – to, to really just paint the final picture on how good Mick is playing this year, he's currently leading the tour at 51 under par. The next best, unsurprisingly, is Andrew Martin, uh, 20 shots back at 31 under par. So he's – so Micker is far and away the best player, uh, and then Christopher Wooden, Hayden Barron, and I. I asked that question almost as a setup to myself, set up to myself here, but uh, I think Hayden Barron is is primed for a massive back half of the year. He's played uh, again, played that Blitz Golf tournament uh, over in Adelaide, played quite nicely, uh, has been going great guns uh, so far this season, including an impressive performance at the Australian Open. So I think Hayden Barron is set for a massive back half of the year, and it wouldn't at all surprise me to see uh, to see him uh, secure one of those cards. I tend to agree, my friend, and I'd love to see Baz do it. You know, you know a, a, an appearance at the Open Championship is phenomenal, mm. but I'd love to see him have the opportunity to play in Europe when he pleases. Yeah. Uh, be even better. So, yeah, agreed. Right. Uh, and then just finally on the home front, Drew, is an announcement on a little bit of an increase to the purse around the WebEx series events, which is welcome news. Mm. Yes. Four tournaments, TPS Victoria, TPS Murray River, TPS Sydney, and TPS Hunter Valley, all increasing to 250000 which is an increase of 50 k uh, which is uh, excellent news. So it brings that WebEx player series total to a million bucks. Uh, which is absolutely fantastic to see, and uh, credit to Gavin Kirkman and, and his team, Nick Dasty as well, what they've uh, put together here. And um, yeah, there's a there's a fantastic media release article on the uh, on the website um, on the uh, PGA Tour of Australasia's website. So go and have a read of that. That'll give you all the information. But uh, a welcome announcement. Not to be sneezed at it, but like some people might say, "Oh, fifty grand." Like when you split it amongst the field, like cumulatively, that's two hundred grand that we found. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, let's not let's not be naive. The TBS tournaments, while excellent, aren't the flagship tournaments of the summer. Mm. So any increase in prize money to them is welcome. And the fact they've cumulatively found an extra almost quarter of a million dollars to spread across that yeah. pool is significant. So yeah. um, you know, they they deserve rightfully so. Uh, you know, credit where it's due, absolutely. Correct. Where would you uh, like to go next? Well, I want to probably, you know, we've, we've kept it on the home front, but some Australians abroad, uh, Min Wu, I, I stayed up and watched the end of this last night uh, and once again we come tantalisingly close mm. to another victory on the DP World Tour for Min Wu Lee. Um, sure, Victor Perez hit honestly one of the most ridiculous bunker shots I've ever seen in my life. Mm. And by his own admission, the best shot he's ever hit in his life. Mm. Uh, but 
yeah, that necessarily wasn't the difference. It, 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 it certainly, you know, landed a punch that may have been difficult to recover from, but I guess just agonisingly close again for Minwoo on the DP World Tour. Yeah, well, I mean, he's he is playing very consistent golf, and and that's all you can ask at the moment. And another win will come. I think he was the only player to hit all four rounds in the sixties from from memory. Um, and uh, and I guess you know for Victor Perez, it was really that second round sixty five that kind of locked him up as the win. Um, no one no one got uh, near a sixty five. Oh, well, Scrooge actually got a sixty five in the first round, I believe. Um. He finished inside the top ten as well. So yeah, it's yeah. So so close. And that shot that's uh for, for Eagle on the last there uh, was just so tantalizingly close to steal your word there. And it was immensely frustrating. But uh yeah, a T two finish I'm sure will will sting a little, but uh he adds a, a million bucks in the bank, uh, which I'm sure might take the uh, sting out of it a little bit. Mm. Uh, you mentioned Scrooge there, the other Aussie tie for seven thirteen hundred five shots back. He was really impressive through the yeah. opening round sixty five and, and then a Sunday sixty eight. So good to see Scrooge back in a bit of form. Uh, Podrick Arrington, out right fourth, two shots back sixteen hundred. <laughs> Holy moly, he's <laughs> winding the clock back. Yes. Um, one person I do want to mention here, Drudes, out of uh, the event in Abu Dhabi. Is a gentleman who leads um, uh, the pair at a tie for fifth at fourteen hundred four shots back, and that's Francesco Molinari. Mm. Now, you and I have spoken at great lengths uh, about the fall of Francesco Molinari uh, mm. when he seemingly uh, smashed a horcrux of himself on the 15th hole at Augusta National in 2019. I actually think the branch that overhangs the left-hand side of the fairway on the 15th of Augusta is one of Molinari's horcruxes. And when his ball hit that branch and ultimately ended up in the water, uh, a part of his soul did, in fact, die because Mm. he he fell off a cliff Mm. after that moment. Um, he, He is clawing his way back. Now, I don't say this on the strength of one performance in Abu Dhabi, if you rewind a week, he led the uh, – this was really weird. I don't know if you saw the Hero Cup. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent. But the Hero Cup was an event played last week, which was Team Great Britain and Ireland against Team Europe. It was kind of like an intra-club match mm. in preparation for the for the Ryder Cup. They literally just split the Europeans and the great British and Irish players into two teams and played against each other in something called the Hero Cup. Uh, Europeans ended up winning, led by Molinari in a Renaissance type performance. Frank's back. I think he might be back. And it bodes well because we've just scraped inside 250 days until the Ryder Cup in his home country, no less. Uh, this all, like all roads led to Rome, and the big fella is back in a big way, I think. Well, it tends to happen in Ryder Cup years. Mm-hmm. And, and I, as it goes on, I, I recall now going back a couple of years ago and he did a very similar thing. He played well in a Ryder Cup year and, and you know, he's not young anymore. So he's he's peaking for the Ryder Cup years and and good on him. A little bit like Bryson does or did when uh, for the majors. So, um, yeah, good good on him. I'm, I, I'm all for it. I think, I, look, I don't know, he may get, he may get a run purely on the fact that half the Ryder Cup team for Europe is playing on the Live Golf Tournament uh, Tour, so they, they're ineligible at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I, I look, he's probably not the worst pick, given he will be the hometown hero um, in in uh, Italy. So it'll be a fascinating watch to see if he does continue on, um, continue on that trajectory. But there are a couple of others I just wanted to pick out from that tournament. Uh, very yes. quickly, Sammy Valamaki, uh, ten under today, huge performance to finish uh, inside the top ten. Um, I scroll down a little bit further, and and uh, it's a name I don't think that we've ever mentioned on this show. Okay. Antoine Rosner finished T fifty 
went into the day at 11 under par. And look, I'm not saying had a genuine shot of winning, but Victor Perez shot six under and finished at 18 under par. So if Antoine Rosner went out and did that, he would have been finishing alongside Minwoo Lee uh, in T2. Instead, he went out and shot six over to tumble all the way down to T50. Mm. So rough day for Antoine. So I just wanted to uh, just hang some shit on him very quickly. Well, and that was about it. Can I, if, we, if we're going to single out Antoine, it would be unfair not to do the same as Shane Lowry. True. Uh, one of our favourites. Spirit animal, often described as the spirit animal of this podcast. Yes. Uh, 76. Mm, rough. On Sunday to finish at nine under. He was right there after yep. 54 holes. Like yep. right there and absolutely fell over himself in the final round last night Australian time. So yes. only, only fair to call out Shane if we're going to call out Antoine. Yep. No, good call. Anyone else from there? No, okay. no. So let's head finally to uh, the PGA Tour. We've not spoken much about the PGA Tour. We're three events in now. Obviously, we had the Hawaiian Swing, uh, the Century Tournament of Champions, and the Sony, uh, and then uh, the American Express over the weekend, um, won by John Rahm, uh, ironically, as was the Century Tournament of Champions. Uh, he's now won four of his last six and two of the first three tournaments of the year. Uh, and as I said to you before we hit record, that's before we've even got to Torrey Pines where he always wins. Um, so John Rahm is in what they generally call a purple patch mm. of form, but seemingly doing it, uh, and this is terribly disrespectful to the amount of work that gets put in, but seemingly doing it relatively easily. Yes. He's yeah. Well, it is scary, right? Because as you rightly pointed out before we hit the record, we haven't even gone to Tory and he just automatically wins there. And then all of a sudden we edge very close to the beginning of major season. And yeah. um, I think, look, that's the challenge for, for John Rahm now is to, uh, to transition that into – to major tournaments. He's obviously only got the one against his name right now. But um, I believe I was That's reading. Nice, ironically. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I was reading before, and the number might be incorrect. I think it's 28 worldwide wins. Um, so, you know, he's winning prolifically, but um, that the we often measure, uh, well, we always measure players on whether they win majors or not. And he's obviously got one to his name, which is a fantastic achievement, but for him to continue to make the rise in the ascension of the the greats of the game, he's going to have to um, continue to step up at uh, at majors. I agree. I think think twenty twenty three might be the year. Mm. If we're going to go to several places, not least of which again Augusta National, yeah, which which set up well for John. Mm. I, there is. Aside from his chipping, there isn't a part of his game that really concerns me. And even his chipping is only like bad when it really goes bad. He had a mm. horrific chipping year last year. But he is like generally m- might be the best all round player in golf. There are better players, mm. not, not many. I mean, he's now the second best player in the world based on rankings. And I, I still think the man ahead of him is ahead of him. Um, but he doesn't jump off the page at one skill over the other. It's just, it's all so good and all so consistent. And yeah, he, man, he's, he is playing some outrageous, outrageous goal at present. Um to be uh, two wins through the first three tournaments of the year and four wins over his last six starts. It's a, it's a hard one to discuss in terms of best player in the world at the moment because of obviously the the issues that everyone's uh, that we've got in terms of 
uh, the OWG, OWGR rankings and and live golf. Um, I, I don't. I think it's. I think it's very difficult to 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 not say that he is right now the best player in the world. Um, Cam Smith, we haven't seen play for a long time um, in terms of, uh, you know, since pre-Christmas. So right now I would feel pretty comfortable in saying that John Rahm is the best player in the world. And and it's crazy that he sits by, sits um, a, a little distance behind Rory McIlroy, still at number one, and Scotty Scheffler at number two now. Um, and it's even more bizarre to me that Patrick Cant lays at number five. Um, so... Yeah, it's. I think he's the best player in the world right now, and and I tend to agree with you that twenty twenty three could be a big year for him in terms of the majors. So uh, yeah, watch this space, big time. Watch the space with John Rahm. They're great. Realistically, I don't think there's anyone other than Cam Smith that threatens the majors from the live side coming back in. Mm. And so when you're talking about like who else, Rory obviously, mm. Smith obviously. I think you have to give some respect to Scotty Scheffler off the back of his major performances and just his all-round performances last year. Mm. Uh, and then maybe maybe Justin Thomas is in that conversation as well. But, yeah, like... I mean, there's always guys that you never write off, right? Like, you never write off a DJ, even yeah, when course, we, never, we never know what it is. There's... Um, same with I would even put Jordan Spieth into that. I mean, he's not playing great golf, right? But you'd what never write him off. He was on fire in the first round of the Sony Open. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Who cares, right? So, well, yeah, he is it's... The, only, the third player in history to hold uh, equal lead after 18 holes and miss the cut. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable but gear. That that encapsulates, like, that if, if if any one single thing encapsulates the Jordan Sweet experience, it was that. It was those first two rounds of the Sony. I'm with Incredible. you. Incredible. I'm with you. Incredible. Uh, anyways, uh, I think that, that probably does us. Does. Um, so as we said, Cassie Porter coming later this week, back in action um, from an Australian tour perspective at Rosebud this weekend. Looking forward to keeping an eye on that. Um, we sneak ever so closer to business end of the season. We sneak ever so closer to an impending four match test series in India, which I'm sure will um, yes. keep keep our focus in and around the golf. Uh, we hey, quick, so- quick question. I'm doing a doing a poll. I'll put this on Twitter. Thoughts on the test players going back and playing Big Bash? Hate it. Yeah, agreed. Why? Why the fuck? Aren't we in India already? Agreed. Like, what are we doing? I, it just it reeks of arrogance. Don't get me wrong. Have loved Usman Khawaja's calm leadership back at the heat. And I think there's a direct correlation, because he certainly hasn't been contributing runs, but I think there's a direct correlation between his leadership and them winning, um, you know, three or four on the trot and putting themselves back in finals contention, having looked like an absolute basket case through the first half of the season. Mm. I'd much rather was he already on a plane playing like two or three warm up games against some Ranji Trophy teams on some absolute Bunsen burners. Like, what are we doing? It's yeah. like, no, 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 no. We're going to hang around for a handful of BBL games and the fucking Allen Border medal and then we're going to fly out. Like, the AB medal's on like the 29th or 30th and we fly the next day. The first test starts on the 8th of February. We're there for like a week before the first test. What are we doing? It honestly, it just reeks of arrogance that we're like, you know what? We don't actually need to prepare for India. We've just, we've just had a great test summer. But in fairness, you played West Indies, who are lucky to be a test team, and South Africa, who were so far behind what everyone drew them up to be coming over here. Wow. And we're now going to go to India. And play a yep. very good test side in probably the hardest place to play cricket in the world. A place and, we haven't won since 2004. And we're out here playing the Big Bash. Like, I'm not only big is big it, big. not only is it, like, increase the risk of injury. Like, do we need to? Like, I get it from a marketing perspective. Like, trust me, I, I understand why. And they've been paid very handsomely. Like, David Warner's earning 350k or something for a handful of games. But honestly, just 
what well, doesn't make that to much be, of a To be fair, mate, like if David Warner wants to stick around and, and hang around in Australia, he doesn't even have to go to India. I'm not, I'm not fast, mate. I, I, yeah. Matt Renshaw, I mean, he, he, he can I, can I tell you? He better so, get a gig. If Matt Renshaw doesn't get a gig in India, like this, might, that might do me for the Australian team. We're gonna get, we're gonna get sidetracked here, but to your first point, I honestly don't know that having the players back shifts the needle that much. I don't get me wrong, Steve Smith peeling off like two hundred and ninety-three <laughs> runs in three games has been excellent, um, and I, I don't think. I don't think he has suffered at all because he's going in in a purple patch. Mind you, Virat Kohli's just peeled off three one-day international tons in a row. So, like, he's batting all right too. Yeah. Um, I don't think them being here shifts the needle that much on crowds. But I'm I'm sure that there's data, hashtag data, in the Cricket Australia offices that suggest differently. Secondly, let me, let me just forecast something for you for David Warner. This is a controversial opinion because... 25 test centuries is phenomenal player, phenomenal player. Mm. And it's okay to be a phenomenal player and I don't like you at the same time. That's fine. I think that double hundred in Melbourne, uh, long term for the Australian cricket team, terrible. Mm. Because I think it's given him on a, on a relatively dead Melbourne wicket against a tired and limp South African attack he has scored a double hundred in, yes, difficult batting conditions with the heat. No, not doubting that. But I think in the recesses of his mind, he may have been considering bowing out after Sydney. And he's hit a double ton. He's gone, no, nah, I've still got it. I've mm. still got it. I'm still G2G. Can I tell you? Holy pit. Let me tell you what's going to happen. He's going to fail in India. I, I, I see no other I see no other as I watched the footage of the second season of the test of him in that mm. tour of Sri Lanka in 2016 mm. when the ball was turning. He had no idea what was going on. So <laughs> like will fail in India, right? So then what do you do? Do you give him eight innings to comprehensively fail? And then do you go with him again in England, where he's, I mean, he's so good. Look at him last time. He was mm. phenomenal and where they played there last time. He was so bad. Yeah. Like, Stuart Broad was living rent free in his head. Mm-hmm. So, like, at what point do you pull the trigger? So, are you blooding Matt Renshaw from the first Ashes test, having not taken the opportunity to give him four games with Usman Quash at the top of the order? Like, no. it's, it's a terrible outcome because I, like, I can't see Dave. Due respect, playing well in India or in England, mm. when he could have gone out on a high in Sydney. I agree. And I just I don't see it going well, and I don't understand why they're playing the big bash. Like you've actually made me upset now. Yeah. Even like worst case scenario, send the spinners. Send <laughs> send even if you don't feel like Nathan Lyon has to go because he's been there before. Send Swepson, Agar. Mm-hmm. And Murphy, send them now. Send them a week ago, and get them bowling there for three and a half weeks. Because can I tell you, the Indians are laughing mm. at Agar, Swepson, and Murphy. Well, I find this whole debate about a second spinner actual comedy. Like we sit here and we agonise: is it Agar? Is it Swepson? Is it this weird Harry Potter looking bloke from Victoria who's taken a couple of wickets in Shield? The Indians are laughing, mm. like. They've got guys playing twos in Ranji Trophy who spin better than those three. Yep. <laughs> Our second spinner does not concern them, whoever it is. Does not con- In fact, they will probably encourage us to play two spinners. Please play them. Well, play this is what I was going to say. Like, surely, like, like, don't you just pick your best four bowlers, regardless of if they're spinners or, or pace bowlers? Like, I get India turns a lot, right? Like, wouldn't you just take a combination of Boland, Hazelwood, Stark, Cummins, and Lyon, and whatever that combination looks like, it is. What did we have in 2004 when we won? Three quicks and a spinner. Yeah, but but also, like, the, 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 the debate that happens every year, well, first and foremost, the Sydney test, just, uh, I'm at my wit's end with it. Like, it needs to be moved because this is a, this is a joke. Every fucking year, every year, like 
I was sitting in Perth. It was 39 degrees. I was like, just move it now. Move it now. Play a three-day game. Could play it, was, it was a disaster. <laughs> but I am sick of the debate every year that, it, that we have. Well, should we play two spinners in Sydney? Because it turns. Mm. That myth was developed when we had Shane Warne and Stuart McGill mm. who could turn the ball at right angles. It has. It doesn't. It doesn't turn. We it, we never get enough overs on it for it to, to turn. It's a disaster. But anyway, we we I'm not have got di- we have got di- uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not overly opposed to Agar playing that test because the series is done. It's harmless. Get him back in the team. Get some over into it. Overs into him. It becomes a complete mockery when he then doesn't jump on a plane and fly. Mm. and start bowling in India, but rather goes back to the fucking furnace and plays a couple of games for the Scorchies. Yeah. Like, that is a farce. Like, we, we spent the test of getting back in the team, and now what was clear in that test is, with due respect to Ashton, because he has modified his game so much to make him so effective as a T20 bowler, mm. To essentially build a career because he was forgotten about from the test perspective, and ODI cricket's a joke. So he has built his game around making himself a marketable commodity as a T20 bowler. Mm. He doesn't know how to bowl as a test bowler. He doesn't know how to build pressure at an end. He doesn't know how to tie up an end. No. So we give him one test, and then we send him back to T20. Yeah. I, I genuinely think, and this is my, my sort of closing remarks, I genuinely think that we are in trouble against India which will then lead into trouble against the Ashes because I think your prophecy will come true. That And what David Warner has achieved in his career is that it is truly phenomenal. To be plucked out of grade cricket and make your international debut for Australia in a T20 game, make 80-odd and then turn into a very, very, very good test opening batsman is nothing but, short of incredible. Been fantastic. Let's but be clear. There's 20, no 20, succession planning. 25 test centuries. You don't score that if you're not good. No. Phenomenal. Phenomenal player. But yeah, you're right. Totally. This is going to the knock-on effect. So he's going to go to India. He's not going to do anything. And then we're either going to take him to England where he did nothing last time or we're going to throw Renshaw into the deep end with Usman Khawaja, who, let's be honest, is also in the latter half of his career, right? Even though I, I think he could probably play for a lot longer. But the problem is we then go, well, Renshaw, here you go. Here's your opportunity to play in England, in very tough circumstances. And if he doesn't fire, then all of a sudden the pressure that's heaped on that middle order of, of particularly Labuschagne and Smith, if they don't, if England somehow get those two cheaply, like we're in a lot of trouble because we've had this continual just Warner fascination for so long. And I know uh, our middle order is very, very good. We have a very, very good middle order in Ted and yeah. Terry and all the rest of it. But if we could not have the pressure on the top order, I think it would be much, much easier. And we've done nothing to prepare these guys. I think we could be in a world of strife in India. Like, Manus is very susceptible to spin. Do you know what? I hope we are. I hope we get fucking rolled. Oh. Maybe it'll bring us back to earth a little bit because I feel like everyone thinks that we're 10 foot tall at the moment because of what we've achieved over the summer yeah. and how but, well we've done. But, like, we haven't played anyone. The frustrating thing is, like, we have the potential to be... I genuinely feel this group has the potential to be, like, a generational team. Of course. They are They're a phenomenally talented group, but, like, yeah, there seems to be a weird skew of focus on the series that matter as opposed to the series that don't. And it's unfortunate that we had two series that don't really matter for at home. Mm. But let's be clear, these next two series are the most important that we play outside of home series against the same two countries. I was just going to say, (laughs) there's only two teams that matter in that we play in test cricket, and that's England and India. And, I mean, you could try and make me a case for New Zealand as well, but it's England and India, and the rest are irrelevant. The Ashes Ashes is the pinnacle. Yeah. But India, winning in India is this this mythical achievement Mm. that we've so rarely been able to unlock. And... Now we have <laughs> down the barrel of going there, getting eaten alive, mm. and then going into an Ashes series devoid of formal confidence. Mm. Like, it's odd. 
it's truly odd. Like, I'm going to have a lot of sleepless nights because I'll be watching it, but then also probably not sleeping much after the stumps and just thinking, turning everything over in my head, going, what's happened? I don't understand. What are we doing? Yeah. I have been proven I truly do, but I, I just, I, I sense, I have grave fears for David Warner in India and therefore the ripple effects of that on the team. Well, I hope we win as well, but part of me also hopes that we get knocked back peg to just genuinely put us, have a bit of a reality check in the, in the words of Paul Keating, that, you know, the recession that we had to have. Yes. I kind of think that happens in India um, ahead of going to England because you're right, I want to win the Ashes. Um, and if it takes losing in India for us to get our head out of our ass, then so be it. So, but anyway, we were going to wrap this up 20 minutes ago and here we are. So we better yes, wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Right, Dreads, we'll be back in your ears uh, Thursday with Cassie Porter.